This program is about unsolved mysteries. Whenever possible, the actual family members and police officials have participated in recreating the events. What you are about to see is not a news broadcast. This is Lourdes, France. For Catholics, it is a revered spot where many believe a profound miracle occurred in 1858. Ever since, religious pilgrims have come here to pray and to bathe in the natural spring waters, which are said to have divine curative powers. Tonight, we journey to France to meet two remarkable women who say they came to Lourdes gravely ill and left miraculously cured. 1915, Murfreesboro, Arkansas. Seven-year-old Ruby Bradford felt lucky when she and her family survived a killer tornado. But soon after the storm, Ruby's mother died during childbirth, and Ruby's new baby sister was put up for adoption. It's been some 80 years, but Ruby believes someone watching tonight can help find her long-lost sister. And in Northern California, it started as a chilling game of cat and mouse, and with each mile, the stakes escalated until finally the game turned deadly. Authorities need your help to catch a freeway stalker. Tonight, these intriguing mysteries, plus an update in which our viewers help bring down the mastermind of an international drug smuggling operation. This is Lourdes, France, for many a sacred spot exalted in the world's spiritual geography. Hundreds of thousands of pilgrims flock to Lourdes each year. Recently, Unsolved Mysteries traveled to Lourdes as well to bring you a story that began nearly a century and a half ago with a girl named Bernadette. Bernadette Subiru was the oldest child of a poverty-stricken miller. Her family lived in Lourdes, then an obscure French village at the foot of the Pyrenees Mountains, just 30 miles from the border of Spain. On February 11, 1858, Bernadette claimed that in a grotto just outside town, she encountered a beautiful vision, a woman dressed in blue and white. At the woman's command, Bernadette began to dig and unearth the spring. Many believe that Bernadette's vision was a blessed virgin, and the spring offered a promise of divine healing. Nobody is obliged to believe in Lourdes, but I think when you really look and examine all the facts, all the words, all the gestures that surround all these events that took place in 1858, um, I think it's very difficult, really, not to be moved by it in some way. In 1933, the Vatican declared Bernadette Subiru a saint. A basilica was erected over the grotto where she had found the spring. Through the years, Lourdes has developed a reputation for healing, both the spirit and the body. Today, pilgrims wait patiently, sometimes for hours, to immerse themselves in the waters from Bernadette Spring, hoping for a miracle. To date, the Roman Catholic Church has documented 65 miracles at Lourdes. One of those cured was Jean Fratel. 
Le Seigneur fit pour moi des merveilles. The Lord did marvelous things for me. Je ne suis pas ici pour vous dire. I am not croyez. here to tell you to believe. Je suis ici pour vous dire. I am here ce to qui tell you what happened to me. And croyez believe moi, me, it is a strange garant. adventure. Jean Fratel's saga began in the city of Rennes in northern France. In 1937, when she was 23 and working as a nurse, Jeanne was stricken with a gruesome illness, mysterious in origin. Her abdomen grew rock hard and was excruciatingly painful to the touch. Blood oozed from her nose, her mouth, and her intestines. La dernière température, c'était quoi? Doucement. Espérez doucement. Affreux comme maladie. It was a terrible illness. C'est une épreuve de tous les instants. It was a constant trial. Quand le docteur When the doctor says, there is nothing I can do for you, you just have to wait patiently for death. In 11 years, Jean underwent 13 operations. Nothing helped. Eventually, Jean was diagnosed with tubercular peritonitis, for which there was no known cure. On four different occasions, her priest administered last rites. Finally, two of Jean's friends insisted on taking her to Lourdes. So sure was her doctor that Jean's death was imminent, he advised her friends to take a coffin with them. By the time Jeanne arrived at Lourdes, she had been virtually comatose for three months. Her bandages had to be changed 20 times a day. Doctors there felt hopeless about her condition, so Jeanne was immediately taken to mass at the Basilica. One of the priests who served mass that day, Father Albert Rock, remembers vividly. Vous voulez communier, mon enfant? When I approached Jean, I asked myself, would she be able to take Holy Communion or would she vomit the host? Father Rock tried to force a tiny piece of the wafer between Jean's lips. Finally, one of Jean's friends assisted. I close her mouth myself, and she instantly opened her eyes, and she looked at me and asked, where am I? I repeat. Instantly, the moment I push her chin up and her lips met, she opened her eyes. At that moment, she came out of the coma she had been in during July, August, September, and October. Jean was moved into the grotto itself. There, under the watchful gaze of a statue, which stands on the very spot where Bernadette Soubirous saw the Blessed Virgin, Jean says something extraordinary happened. I had the feeling that somebody was taking me under the arms to sit me up. And I turned around to see who it was that helped me and thanked them. I had that feeling again. This time, the two invisible hands were taking my two hands and putting them on my stomach. I was instantly and permanently cured. The Lord says, ask and you shall receive. But I never ask. I received without asking. Believe me, it is such a feeling when it falls onto you just like that. 
Oh là, mon Dieu. My God, poor girl, what happened? What an adventure! Soon Jeanne could stand for the first time in years. She was taken to bathe in the water from Bernadette Spring. The next day, a group of doctors gathered at Lourdes to examine Jeanne. Bonjour, chère madame. Pourriez-vous nous faire une démonstration? Comme vous voulez. Non, non, merci. Je peux me débrouiller toute seule. Vous voyez que je suis peut-être un peu faible. Mais je marche toute seule. Vous aviez une tuberculose méningée. Oui, c'est ça. Avec des complications Oui, mais si vous avez des questions, je voudrais bien m'asseoir. Bien, asseyez-vous. Virtually every symptom of Jean's illness had disappeared. On nous a parlé de votre abdomen qui était gonflé. Il va mieux. Oui, oui, comme vous voyez. The doctors released Jean on November 1st, 1948. She returned to her own city and her own doctor, the same doctor who just three weeks earlier had ordered that a coffin go with her on the train to Lourdes. Je suis, je suis très bien dans le pot. Et vous avez toujours faim? Non, pas maintenant, parce que maintenant ça s'est réduit. Au départ, oui. 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 A professed atheist, the doctor was dumbfounded. On respire encore. And it was then he took me in his arms, big tears rolling down his cheeks, and he said, I do not believe in miracles, yet I have to believe, because you should be in your grave today. After more than 11 years of nearly unbearable pain and suffering, Jean Fratel was finally able to resume a normal life. She became well known as a dedicated, tireless nurse, in 1950, Jean took vows to become a Benedictine nun. No traces of her illness returned. The church referred Jean's case to the National Medical Committee of Paris, made up of both believers and non-believers. A very rigorous comparison was made between her medical status, which was well documented before the illness, and her medical status after the illness. Uh, the medical bureau's findings were then to say, in our eyes, this, according to science, is just inexplicable. They then passed on these findings to the church. The same year, the archdiocese officially declared Jean Fratel's cure a miracle. Today, at the age of 80, Jean continues to live the miracle, devoting herself to physically challenge young people who make the pilgrimage to Lourdes. If you believe in it, good for you. If you do not believe in it, too bad, it is true. I tell about my healing 50, 100 times a day. It matters not. Everything is for the Lord, without a doubt. I accept everything with joy. In 1975, Lorraine Echeverry and her family moved to Phillipsburg, New Jersey. Lorraine was a freshman in high school, active and popular. But that November, when she was 14, Lorraine was stricken with a mysterious illness. Inhale. Good, now exhale. Lorraine's doctor was stumped. She could barely hold her head up. Her eyes rolled involuntarily. She couldn't keep food down. I still got those. Right, and your head? Lorraine was hospitalized for tests, but over and over again, her parents' hopes were dashed by the lack of a diagnosis. Did you get the results back yet? Yes. And? They were negative. But we're going to do another test this afternoon. What kind of test? It's called an electroencephalograph. It was very frightening. Every day you went to the hospital and you saw this child and you saw her getting weaker and sicker and there was no answers. 
they couldn't give her medication because they didn't know what to give her. Uh, steadily, uh, you know, you can see the color in her eyes are leaving. You can see her color is changing. You can see the weakness getting worse. And there's nothing you can do. It's just another test. Maybe this one will give us the answer. Huh? When all else failed, a psychiatrist examined Lorraine. He, too, was at a loss for answers. Finally, Lorraine's parents talked to a friend who reminded them about the baths at Lourdes. No. On March 15, 1976, Lorraine made the pilgrimage to Lourdes, accompanied by her parents and grandmother. Okay. Just take it easy. Daddy's got you. Daddy's got you. Okay. According to Lorraine's parents, her kidneys had begun to fail and the rigors of the trip left her weaker than ever. She kept saying, please, mommy. Speak English? I felt I was doing something to this child, and I should have stayed in the States. What was I doing here in a strange country? I couldn't speak the language. And she's so deathly sick. OK, she can rest here. Louise Barrett, an American volunteer, was asked to stay with the Echeverrias. She suggested that Lorraine's family take some time alone, while Lorraine waited to visit the baths. You look tired. Why don't you go for a walk or take a rest or something? No, no, no. No, no, no there's no need to worry. She'll be fine now. She'll be fine here. It's OK. A walk will do you good. Will you come? This family absolutely needed some help. And what I did kind of as a reaction was to try to be as calm as I could to allow the parents to have some time to be away um, just so that everyone would have a breathing space, because they seemed to be a family that was just an absolute crisis when they arrived. I think at that point, death looked like a welcome relief to me. I, I would have accepted it, and I guess I felt it was very near. I'll be right here, OK? Lorraine began to drift in and out of sleep. She says she had a dream, a vision, which made her feel that everything would be all right. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. In verdant pastures, he gives me repose. Within seconds, the next thing you knew, I was standing next to my body. And I was walking with a beautiful woman. I, I never saw her face. I don't know who it was. I just remember we were walking we were about four or five feet above the ground. I remember her saying to me, you must go back now. And I said, I, I don't want to go back. That body is dying. And she said, yes. You must go back to prove to others he still exists today. And I remember putting my head down, and then I was back in the room, and I was back in my body, and I opened up my eyes. And my mom was standing over me, and we proceeded to get ready to go down to the baths at that time. Lorraine was so ill that a complete immersion in the water seemed out of the question. Even though church officials at Lourdes say it never happens, Lorraine's best recollection is that the attendants poured water over her head. Lorraine's mother kept vigil, reading a prayer to Our Lady of Lourdes, the Virgin Mary. I tried to do everything I could while she was sick. I did the fasting and the prayers and everything. St. Bernadette, pray for us. I could actually physically feel a release within myself in my chest area that I didn't even know the tightness existed until that moment. When she was through with the bath and came out, she looked exactly the same. There was no change. I did not expect that she would be healed or cured. I expected that perhaps 
her family would receive some consolation, um, that perhaps they would receive strength to make it through whatever they had to go through. God bless you, darling. God bless you, honey. That evening, Lorraine's grandmother spent the night in Lorraine's room, hoping against hope that her granddaughter's condition would improve. I never stirred, I never moved, and I was asleep before you know it. And then it was about five hours later, I woke up, 11 o'clock at night, and I was starving, absolutely hungry. I didn't have any pain. I just felt like, I felt terrific. I could fly if I needed to. I got up out of bed, and I looked at myself in the mirror, and I was me again. <laughs> I was whole, I was 100%, and I just, Oh, God, it was all I could do to, for them to contain me. <laughs> oh, I feel better. Look at you. Her eyes, they were beautiful. The color was in the face. She had rosy cheeks, and she was so energetic and full of life. You knew that she was touched. You stood there, and you were witnessing what God just did. I remember um, sitting out the window, it was about one, two o'clock in the morning, listening to the church that's local there chiming every hour and just feeling so glad to be alive and to be healthy and everything was just great. I was just, I couldn't believe I was that blessed. We don't doubt her sincerity, but in the case of Lorraine Echeverry, she never underwent any medical investigation after the healing. And so there would always remain in the minds of the doctors and of the church a certain kind of doubt. We, uh, we appreciate that Lorraine believes that she has truly been touched by God, but we can't give to her situation the same qualification that we give to Jeanne Fratel in recognizing the case of Jeanne Fratel as indeed a miracle. I believe that I was healed at Lourdes, and that it is a miracle. And there is, I believe with every ounce within me, Lourdes is a part of me now, it is my life. And there is, there is no doubt whatsoever that I was touched and that I was healed. What are we to make of these two stories, of these two women? and the thousands of other people who believe that divine grace touched their lives at Lourdes. Perhaps one answer can be found in the Song of Bernadette. For those who believe in God, no explanation is necessary. For those who do not believe in God, no explanation is possible. Recently, we profiled the case of Brian Brofill. His neighbors in Vermont considered him one of the most likable, least threatening people around. Brian Brofill charmed everyone. That is, everyone who didn't know he was the mastermind of a major drug smuggling ring. Brofill had moved to West Glover, Vermont, 1986. Folks hey. there knew him as a good-natured city slicker who didn't seem to have a clue about country life. Even so, Brofill's tastes in horses ran to rare, expensive breeds. He spent thousands boarding his horses with a neighbor, Peggy Dupont. He paid in cash for his board. And my husband immediately said, oh, he's a drug dealer. And I said, he's not a drug dealer. You're out of your mind. He's a nice person. Incredibly, Peggy Dupont's husband was right on target. Four years after moving to Vermont, Brian Brofill's secret life exploded into view when authorities paid a surprise visit to his farm. Inside the barn was a crop of 2,000 marijuana plants. It was the biggest bust in Vermont history. 
Authorities estimated that Brofield's sophisticated pot plantation had grossed up to a quarter of a million dollars a month. But the marijuana farm was only a small part of an international drug smuggling operation. Brofield dropped from sight immediately after the raid and stayed hidden for more than three years until unsolved mysteries came along. Now, could you describe it for me, please? On the night Brofield's story aired, our phone center switchboards lit up with calls from Paso Robles in Central California. Alert viewers there recognized Brian Brofield as one of their neighbors. Okay. Local authorities immediately moved in to make an arrest, but Brofield had vanished again. Our understanding is that Brian watched the show. The show aired at 8 o'clock, and Brian was gone at 8.15. He had left all his personal belongings behind um, and was just gone. In Paso Robles, Brofel went by the name Brian Jenkins. He found work as a handyman at local horse ranches and became an accepted member of the community. Brofel never once drew the attention of police. He was living comfortably with no fears. We weren't even close to him. He could have wrote a, a textbook on how to hide. Uh, he was that good. But Brian Brofield wasn't good enough. After he fled past the Robles, viewer tips helped authorities track the fugitive south to Carlsbad near San Diego, where he was arrested on December 19, 1993. Three weeks later, Brian Brofield was extradited to Vermont. If convicted on all charges, he faces a prison term of 20 years to life. It begins with an innocent evening out. Suddenly, you become aware that someone is watching you. Then he is following your car. Every move you make, he makes. You are being stalked. Only later will you learn that it was your license plate that apparently triggered the stalker and led to a deadly encounter. April 29th, 1991. A few friends got together for drinks in a suburb of San Jose, California. One of the men in the group was Dick Hanson, a former college football star who was rebounding from a tough divorce. That night, Dick had come to the bar with a friend we will call Gene. Why would I leave San Francisco? No, 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 no. Why? It's the best. Why would I go anywhere else? He was in a very good mood. Very good. I mean, it was like it, he almost got like a new lease on life. Is, I don't know how else to describe it. But he was very, he was very happy with where he was. He was very happy with what was going on in his life and where he was headed. At 1 a.m., Dick and Jean left the bar together in Jean's car with Dick driving. Around 1.30, they arrived at a restaurant in San Jose where Dick had left his pickup truck after dinner. There were no cars at all, and I thought, I remarked to Dick, I said, this, this is funny, yours is the only car left on the street. So you uh, want to come over for a little while? Uh, I don't know. You want to get things started again? So we were sitting there talking, and this car pulls up behind us. And I looked, and I thought, I really didn't think it was too strange because there was a mailbox on the sidewalk there. Maybe he's trying to get to the mailbox. Does he have enough room? I mean, we should probably pull forward a little bit. Nah, no problem. He's got plenty of room. The man just sat there. He didn't do anything, and I kept, I was kind of half turned in the seat so I could look at Dick, and I could see him out of the corner of my eye. I don't know what he's doing. I mean, he's just sitting there. He's not doing anything. Do you think he's a cop? Not in that old thing. Despite Jean's misgivings, she and Dick felt there was no reason to worry about the man parked behind them. Because Jean was unfamiliar with the route home, Dick suggested she follow him. At that point in time, I didn't say anything, and Dick didn't say anything. Of course, we didn't know what was going to happen. Well, he pulled out. I pulled out. The guy behind us pulled out. We went up to the stoplight, turn left. Dick turned left, I turned left, the guy turned left. 
We go up two blocks and turned left again. And he did the same thing. Well, by this time, it's making me uncomfortable. So I moved to the middle lane. He moved to the middle lane. So I moved back, and he moved back. I only did it once, but that was enough to tell me that, that this man was definitely following us. At the next traffic light, Dick signaled for Gene to follow him onto the freeway. The man stayed close behind. A strange encounter was about to escalate. For more than 10 miles, the man played a risky game of cat and mouse with Jean, shadowing her every move. Dick was on the inside lane. I was on the outside. And somehow we got the guy, and he was between us, but behind us. And I thought, all right, you rascal, I'm going to get you. So I slammed on my brakes. I'll be darned if he didn't slam on his brakes, too. It was almost like he was reading my mind. The guy, he's still following me. We should go to the police. I can't hear you. Take the next exit. I almost missed the turn, but he followed. This man was still behind me. So I followed Dick down the ramp. We made a, a right-hand turn. Dick just pulled over to the side of the road. I pulled up behind Dick. And I don't know why in my mind, I just knew this guy would just go right on by and wave or something. He pulled right up behind us. And I'm not sure who is in more shock, Dick or I. Do you know the guy? I've never seen him before. Get back in the car. So he walked back to the man and kind of leaned down and he said, what are you, what are you he either said, what are you doing or what do you want? I couldn't quite hear what he said. And the guy said something to him and Dick goes, what? And the guy said something else to him and then proceeded to point to the back of my car. And at that point in time, Dick just stepped back, stood up and went and raised his arm and said, get the blankety blank out of here. So I jumped back in my car, and I looked in my rearview mirror, and I, I hear pop, pop. And we just stared at each other. It must have been for, oh, I'd say at least five to 10 seconds. I'm just staring at him. I got back out of the car and, and ran back to where Dick was. And his eyes were like half closed. Somebody, help! And I tried to find a pulse on his neck. And I, I, it didn't look like he was breathing. So I started to give him mouth to mouth. For 15 agonizing minutes, Gene tried to resuscitate Dick. Police and paramedics, alerted by a passing motorist, would arrive too late. Dick Hansen had been shot twice, once in the chest and once in the neck. He never regained consciousness and was pronounced dead at the hospital. He left behind two daughters, aged 11 and 13. As far as we know, Dick Hansen did not know his assailant. What makes this particular case extremely difficult is when you deal with homicide, most homicides boil down to common denominators of sex, money, or drugs and network out from there. Uh, we have not been able to put this particular homicide in any of those categories so that we can develop a motive. However, police have come up with one possible theory about this case. Jean was a San Francisco football fan, and her personalized license plate read 49er Hugs. 
The killer had gestured toward her license plate while he was talking to Dick. Dick Hansen's physical stature was that of a football player. So we were looking into the theory of a disgruntled fan uh, as being one of the responsibles. The suspect is white, possibly Hispanic or Mediterranean, in his late 30s or early 40s. He was tan and wore eyeglasses with large black frames. The suspect's vehicle resembled a 1970 Pontiac GTO Le Mans two-door coupe with a dull, faded, light gray or blue paint job. When we return, a devastating tornado leaves a path of destruction and separates a family. Perhaps you can help reunite them. You're about to meet a spry 86-year-old woman named Ruby McDaniel. Ruby is a matriarch of her clan. At the annual McDaniel reunion, she is surrounded by five children, 15 grandchildren, and 21 great-grandchildren. But more than 75 years have passed since Ruby saw one very special member of her family, her younger sister, Vernice. Perhaps tonight, one of our viewers can help end their long separation. The year was 1915, a blustery autumn day in Murfreesboro, Arkansas. Mac Bradford and his wife Ruth owned a small farm on the edge of town. They had two children, Ruby and Buster, and a third was on the way. Ruth was six months pregnant. Look how long Ruby's hair's getting. Looks real pretty, honey. Thank you, Papa. Ruth, get the children out. The horrifying moments that followed remain etched in Ruby's memory nearly 80 years later. It was dark, and it, it just a roar, like a train or something coming. I was scared. I didn't know what was going to happen next. Well, Papa put everybody down. And then he laid down, wrapped his arms around this post, garden post. That's what I guess saved us. Because if we'd have stayed in the house, it, we would have probably got killed. That day, a killer tornado ripped through central Arkansas. 10 were killed and 45 were injured. Property damage was recorded that would equal more than $4 million in today's economy. At the Bradford farm, the garden post was just about the only thing left standing. Even though the house would be rebuilt, the family would soon suffer another tragic loss. During the tornado, Ruth Bradford was severely injured when she was struck by a wooden beam. A few months later, while still recuperating, Ruth came down with yellow fever went into premature labor. There you are, Mac. It's a girl. Little girl. Yeah. Oh, dog. Oh, she's beautiful. Yeah. yeah. How's Ruth? Arresting. Uh, Resting. She's, she's gonna be all right, isn't she, Doc? It's hard to say. I gotta be honest with you, Mac. She may not make it through the night. On the very evening that Ruth Bradford gave life to her baby, she lost her fight with yellow fever. Her husband, Mac, was now faced with an impossible dilemma, raising two young children and a newborn on his own. The next day, Ruby, who was just seven and a half, watched in confusion as a man and a woman came to the house and took her new baby sister away. Later, Mac led Ruby and Buster down to the cellar to try to explain what had happened. It was the one place Mac knew they could be alone. Now, y'all don't have your mom anymore. I do remember him crying, and uh, he tried to explain to us about her, you know. When's the baby coming back? You know, we couldn't take care of her. 
So she's gonna go live with some nice folks in town. But even though she's not with us, we can still love her. And he thought he was doing the very best he could do. And I think he did. I don't want you two to worry about that. And that's the only time I can remember my papa ever crying. And he, he really did boo-hoo a lot. The baby was adopted by a Mr. and Mrs. Logston, who also lived in Murfreesboro. Mr. Logston was an attorney, his wife a registered nurse. They named the little girl Vernice. Three years later, in 1918, Mac took Ruby and Buster on a surprise trip to the Logston home. Ruby, Buster, see that little girl in the window there? That's your little sister. And Papa told us, now you all way better. Says, look down, way better. We did, and she way back. And that thrilled us very much, and it did him too. <laughs> and we thought she was so pretty. The fleeting encounter was as close as Ruby ever got to Vernice. It was the last time she ever saw her baby sister. A short time later, Mac received this photograph of three-year-old Vernice in the mail. When Vernice was six, the Logsons moved away from Murfreesboro, and Mac never heard from them again. Eventually, Mac Bradford remarried and fathered 12 more children. In 1984, Mac passed away at the age of 92. In his memory, Ruby has vowed that she will one day find her sister. Oh, it'd be so great if I could see her. Because, <laughs> you know, I don't have too many more years here. <laughs> and I sure would love to see her. Let her see all them brothers and sisters she's got. <laughs> Coming up next week, a special segment on the fascinating mysteries of animals. We'll focus on two ordinary but lost household pets who have made incredible journeys over hundreds of miles to find their way home. Do animals have a kind of psychic radar that defies scientific explanation? It is widely known that military programs, such as the development of the stealth bomber, are highly classified. Now some believe that the same programs are being used to unravel the secrets of UFOs. Join me next time for these fascinating stories and more on Unsolved Mysteries.